Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. In April of 1970, the NFO broiler producers in the state of Alabama initiated a space holding action. At that time, U.S. Farm Report and its crew went to Cullman County, Alabama to cover on film that event. Playing a dominant role at that time and at that place representing the National Farmers Organization at the national level was Mr. Bill Talbert, who is one of our guests on today's show. Also, a little later in the show, we'll be hearing from Mr. W.O. Thomas of Cullman County, Alabama, who will bring us up to date on the success of the space holding action through that southern state. Bill, it's a pleasure to welcome you to U.S. Farm Report. Very nice to be here, Bill. I should uh, qualify you, by the way, as uh, head of the Educational Services Department at NFO, and I assure you that one day in the not too far distant future, uh, we will be doing a feature show on your department, which is one of the most important of all at national headquarters of the National Farmers Organization. Well, it's nice of you to say so, Bill, and uh, I'll be looking forward to working with you. You wear a couple of hats, obviously, because you've done a whale of a job in this broiler uh, situation uh, down in Alabama. Now, let's talk, before we get to specifically the situation in the state of Alabama, about the broiler industry nationwide. Uh, where is the main broiler production in the country, Bill? Well, of course, this was interesting, it seems to me, as we uh, delved into this broiler industry. It was interesting to research it, uh, determine where the heavy producing areas were located, things of this nature. We find out that uh, broilers are commercially produced in, in about 22 states out of the nation. The real heavy producing areas lie in the southeast. Georgia is the number one producing state. Arkansas ranks uh, very close, number two, with Alabama following Arkansas mm -hmm. in third place. Up along the eastern seaboard into Maryland and Delaware, there's a heavy producing area, as well as into Maine, which happens to be the eighth largest broiler producing state in the nation. Then obviously, uh, comparatively few states produce all of the broilers in the country. Yes, I think that's right. Now, Bill, what is the status quo of the broiler producer across the country today? Really, Bill, when you study it, uh, you'd have to say that it's the most depressing situation that exists in agriculture. I, I don't think there's anything that quite compares with it. These broader producers are actually living in bondage. They've borrowed the money to build the buildings, to furnish the buildings with equipment necessary to produce broaders. In doing so, they've mortgaged their farm and homes. Now, at this point, the return, financial return for producing broaders gives them, in most cases, just about enough to cover the payment on the building. But they must keep producing broilers, even though they're not netting any profit from it. They must keep producing broilers in order to make the payment on the buildings so as not to lose the farm and home, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. So really, I think it's correct to say they're living in bondage, uh, slaves to an industry that uh, uh, doesn't allow them uh, enough profit to live on. When we refer to the industry that does not allow them enough profit to live on, we're referring, aren't we, to the vertical integrator? Yes, the vertical integrator plays an important part here. And for the, the people who don't understand the term vertical integrator, although most people are becoming familiar with it, especially in agriculture, means that uh, someone has either owns or controls the industry from virtually one end to the other. Well, why doesn't the broiler producer do something about it? Well, this was my first uh, question, too, uh, after going into the broiler industry and beginning to study it and working with the people. Why don't they do something? And I found that most of these people were, were fearful of doing anything that might uh, antagonize the integrator in any way. Because we find in, in most areas there's a surplus of broiler houses. Uh, whether it's by accident or on purpose, there's a surplus of broader houses. So all broader producers live in constant fear of being cut off, not being provided ba baby chicks, and, and thereby have this income cut off that allows them to make the payment on the building, you see. Mm -hmm. So this, again, uh, has a tendency to make them slaves to their industry, to keep producing and say nothing. 
Now, W.O. Thomas, a little later in our show, as I stated, is going to talk about the broiler industry situation in Alabama, and particularly around his home county of Cullman. But perhaps it would be in order for you, Bill, to tell our viewers just exactly what kind of an arrangement the vertical integrator has with the broiler producer. It's a contractual arrangement, Bill. The contract is drawn up by the integrator. The broiler producer then produces broilers under that contract or doesn't produce broilers at all. It's really quite simple. Mm -hmm. It's a contract drawn up by one individual, the other individual produces under that contract or he doesn't produce. Now, what exactly does the integrator do? And in turn, what does the producer do? The integrator provides the baby chicks, places them in the house. He provides the feed for the chicks. He picks the chicks up normally at about an eight week period of age and takes them off to the processing plant with the processed and the producer is sent them the settlement sheet and the check. Mm -hmm. The producer provides the building, the equipment, the electricity, water, and labor. Whatever is needed here in the production of the, of the bird is provided by the producer. How did NFO get into the broiler industry? Well, as I mentioned, Bill, the, the producer has been somewhat fearful and, and rightfully so. But when he heard of the NFO, he, he looked to the NFO with, with hope in his heart, really, that here was an organization that he could look to that uh, would provide him with some hope for the future and better prices. Mm -hmm. Well, he had to turn somewhere, didn't he? That's right. As an individual, he was helpless. Yes. Well, now, what can NFO do for these people? Many things, really, Bill. Of course, we can't do it all for them. Uh, they must provide uh, a lot of the motivation themselves. Of course, the NFO has been highly success successful in, in many other commodities, grain, dairy, meat, and many other smaller commodities. So we do have the, the skilled leadership, the collective bargaining know-how, so to speak. So we can give them the leadership that's needed, because really the problem isn't that much different in the broader industry than it is in any other commodity. So we can give them the, uh, the skilled leadership that they so desperately need. Also, of course, we can give them the legal advice because whatever is done here is always must be done in a, a legal manner. So we can keep them on the right path here, so to speak, by, uh, by assisting with legal advice. I think probably the most important aspect is the nationwide aspect, that is, communications nationwide, the ability to have uh, current instant communications from one area to another so that we have can have this industry-wide impact or this industry-wide effect from a bargaining standpoint. Now, down in Alabama, did NFO tell these people to lock up their broiler houses? No, these, these actions of this type are usually of a spontaneous nature. The, the attitude was there, the attitude uh, developed, and the producers act on their own initiative. Mm -hmm. What is NFO's ultimate goal for the uh, broiler producer, Bill? It's a good question, Bill, and I'd like to answer it in this way. And it, uh, I think, parallels our objectives in all commodities. Our objective within the broiler industry, as far as producers are concerned, is to provide the mechanics or the framework or the structure so that uh, they may get in a position through their organized strength to be able to have a voice in writing the contract mm -hmm. that they're going to be producing chicks under. Yeah. And having a voice in writing this contract will, of course, uh, give them the benefit of higher prices within that contract. The tentacles of vertical integration are reaching out and spreading into other agricultural areas, aren't they? Uh, that's right, Bill. We see this in many areas. Having, to a great extent, I feel, paralyzed the broiler industry uh, vertical integration now is, is reaching into the swine industry in quite a few areas. We see tremendous development and expansion in Arkansas, uh, northern Georgia, north and south Carolina, uh, as well as many of the Midwestern states where some form of vertical integration within the swine industries is starting to develop. Philip Wilkie, son of the famous Wendell Wilkie, presidential candidate against Franklin Roosevelt in 1940, was at the convention. Of course, you and I don't remember 
Wendell Wilkie, do we, Bill? Oh, you were no, that too was young for that. back in <laughs> 1940. <laughs> now, Philip Wilkie, of course, is a, a great, enthusiastic attacker of the corporate conglomerates. He also attacked the large feed concerns who are in the business of vertical integration and contends that there should be federal legislation against uh, this kind of thing. How do you feel about that? Well, I couldn't agree more, Bill, and I'm sure that uh, uh, leg proposed legislation of this type uh, will, will come in the not-too-distant future, not only at federal level, but at state level, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Philip Wilkie, by the way, will be a special guest on one of our uh, U.S. Farm Report shows in the very near future, Bill. Fine. I want you to be sure to keep watching. Glad to hear it. Now, uh, if you don't mind, uh, let's watch together as I visited with uh, Mr. W.O. Thomas uh, from down in Cullman, Alabama. In April of 1970, our U.S. Farm Report crew traveled to Cullman, Alabama to cover the broiler producer's dilemma in that area. It was in April that NFO declared a space holding action among its members in the broiler business in that part of the country. On our trip to Cullman, Alabama, one of our hosts was W.O. Thomas, a fine gentleman, a farmer from Cullman most of his life, and I am delighted today to welcome W.O. back to U.S. Farm Report for purposes of reminiscing about our trip to Cullman last April and to find out what progress has been made in the broiler situation there in the last few months. W.O., I understand congratulations to some degree in order because since I was there in April, you have assumed a new role for NFO, Regional Broiler Director. Either I offer you congratulations or condolences, one or the other. Which do you think it should be? Well, still, that could be either way. <laughs> well, how's it going uh, with, with your new job? How much territory are you covering? Well, uh, mostly North Alabama, but uh, I do make trips into Georgia and uh, other areas in this southeast at the mm -hmm. present time. We're trying to get this broiler program to move in belt wide instead of a small area. Let's talk a little bit about Cullman, Alabama. As I recall, W.O., Cullman is among the top 100 counties in the whole nation in, uh, in agricultural production dollar-wise, isn't it? That is right, Bill. And uh, it is Alabama's number one agricultural county. This is correct also. It's how long have you farmed there? I said most of your life, and I think that was right. Well, I started uh, in uh, 1931 of actually participating and taking hold. In 1936, well, then I began to manage it. Mm -hmm. Now, W.O., let's talk a little bit about what I have termed since my trip to Coleman as the broiler producer's dilemma. Can you uh, sort of uh, background this for us? Tell us about, historically, how the situation as it exists today developed. Well, it's a long story there, Bill, but uh, on this, why, we have gradually moved from the independent to this integrated broiler. We've had a great deal of problems of trying to sell our broilers after we moved into the integrated. We couldn't sell them, and even the independent producers were forced to go into the integration in order to have a market for their broiler. Now, uh, the way this thing started, uh, I was an independent producer starting in 1936. And I remained independent even after I came back from World War II. I was gone four years, World War II, and came back, and I stepped back into chicken production, mm -hmm. eggs and broilers. And I'm fairly typical of what is happening there. I stayed, remained independent uh, until in the middle 50s. Integration started, though, in the late 40s and early 50s. They offered the uh, growers, if they'd get larger, more efficient, they would finance the chickens and feed and set them a price on it. This was very attractive to start off with. They did this. But uh, the requirements then that they started making, once they got the broiler group producer, in debt, then they began to lower the prices. 
The prices continued to lower, and they began to make heavier demands to the type of equipment, type of building, and what the producer was to put out. Mm -hmm. Well, this producer at that time, majority of them felt like that they had such an investment, they had this debt for this equipment and housing over their head until they had to produce broilers at whatever price they were offered. It was pretty much a vicious circle by that time, I right. guess. Right. It had together to be a vicious circle yeah. at that time. Uh -huh. Now, when I was in Cullman, the uh, integrator was paying around two cents for chicks. Um, let's talk about, for that two cents per pound, and the average uh, broiler, as I understand it, weighs around seven pounds, so we're talking, or rather around three and a half pounds, so we're talking about seven cents per bird, aren't we? Right. Now, in order to get that seven cents per bird, the integrator provides, as you said, the chicks. He also provides the feed. What does the broiler producer provide then? The broiler producer, Bill, under this integrated contract, provides the housing. He provides the heat, provides the litter, provides the utility, and of course, then he provides the labor. I don't see how in the world he can make it, and he's not making it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this heat factor. Uh, Northern Alabama gets pretty cold winters sometimes, right? Right. Uh, and it takes some heat to take care of those birds, and uh, this is a very expensive proposition, isn't it, W.O.? It is. It's uh, nine, eight to nine months out of the year there will be some heat required on those broilers, and uh, approximately six months out of the year there will be heavy heat requirements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, most of those broiler houses are heated by coal, aren't they, W.O.? Right, the majority of them are heated by coal. But uh, there is now underway uh, a trend toward uh, putting in natural gas. Right. Are some of the integrators requiring this change? Uh, they would like to require this change, Bill. Before our action started last spring, they had already put out the information. In fact, one integrator went as far as to got a location. Mm -hmm. on the railroad spur to put in the gas tank. He was going to put the gas in and require the go growers to buy this gas from him instead of the <laughs> local gas company. <laughs> that's, that's quite a scheme, isn't but it? But they were, they were trying to move to this, yes. and they had made the arrangements, including the spur being built for these storage tanks. I recall so distinctly, W.O., being in Coleman and attending uh, meetings there that uh, your broiler producers refer to themselves as chicken house janitors because that's pretty much uh, what they are relegated to, isn't it? That's right. Well, now, let's talk a little bit about the holding action, what the issues were, how it has uh, progressed, and then we'll get to the status quo. What were the bigger issues in the, in the space holding action? Well, of course, there was the issue of pay. And uh, then uh, been referred to as friends' benefits, which was equally as imported as the pay. Now, some of those were what, W.O.? The condemnation. This was the number one issue. The litter, clean-out, sanitation of these houses. Mm -hmm. This heat bill. The grower having no say-so in any of these matters. Mm -hmm. These were some of the main friends' benefits that Let's talk a moment about the condemnation factor. Now, here is a situation where those birds that were condemned by inspectors perhaps were so condemned because of some sort of disease that existed in these birds at the time they were hatched. Isn't that about the, that, the fact? That is a fact, uh, Bill. This disease came from this breeder flock of chicken of which the integrator owned or controlled. And over which the broiler producer had no control. The broiler producer had no control and he had no say so of which flock or any of this yes. type of thing that he got his chicken from. And yet it was the broiler producer who was paying the freight in the condemnation factor. Right. Okay, well now tell me about how the holding action has gone, W.O. Well, the holding action is still going, Bill. It has been uh, 
rugged. It has been, as Owen Lee Staley told us that night, a war of nerves. They have been ragged, jagged edge nerves in the holding action. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have at least made some progress. Uh, we're on uh, two contracts that we have under negotiations at the present time that may be a step to put this back into the broiler growers' hand instead of the integrator's mm -hmm. hand. Mm -hmm. There has been progress made in uh, one sense on the pay. Now, in the Cullman area, as we mentioned before, since that uh, we had organized and the threats, they moved the contract price up from a cent and a half to a cent ninety a pound, two cents a pound with some integrators. Yes. And uh, the way that I refer to this as progress, the price of broilers this fall that the integrators have got have dropped very low. In uh, some areas that I'm in contact with or work with, they have cut the price of growing broilers to these growers to as low as a cent a pound. A cent a pound. A cent a pound. In the area that we're involved in, that this whole action is going on, for some reason, the uh, integrators do not dare mm -hmm. to cut it from this cent and a half to two cents a pound. Yes. It's remaining on there. Well, that's some progress in itself because of the financial condition that we have some of our members that have had to grow broilers to try to keep the mortgage. They can't make anything, but at least the financial institutions are satisfied to go along with them a while longer if they've got broilers in the house. W.O., in April, when I was in Cullman, a number of the broiler producers in that area had started to convert some of their broiler house space to hogs. Uh, how's that working out? Well, Bill, it's not working out too good. Well, it, you've had a bad price situation. The on price hogs, situation has affected them. And this is another thing that's a uh, sore spot over the nation mm -hmm. that uh, when uh, you try to convert in any segment of agriculture to where that you're not getting a price for one commodity, you convert to another segment of it, then you overproduce in that area, yes. forcing that prices down. And uh, this may be some of the problem here on the hog production because of this conversion that uh, the prices have gone down and they haven't turned out really too well with it. Mm -hmm. By the way, I think it's interesting to point out to our viewers that the holding action going on uh, down in your part of the country is uh, perhaps unique to NFO in that you're not holding a commodity, you are actually holding space. Great. And I don't know that the NFO has ever done this before, but uh, this is about it. You're holding space in your, in your broiler houses. Well, due to the uniqueness of this situation, I guess that uh, this would be about the only commodity that would work well, this it way. it sure would, because you really don't own the commodity. We don't own the commodity. Yeah, yeah. We just own the facilities to grow the commodity and the labor to produce them. What were the signs that uh, many of your people put on their broiler house doors? What did they say? These doors will be closed for contract overhaul. That's it. They've never had anything to say in the writing of the contracts they're under now. The integrators wrote these up to suit themselves. In fact, uh, legal sources that uh, we have consulted on this have been amazed that they could even get the contract signed. But this brought a producer out there that has a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar mortgage on that place. And this is the source he's looking from to meet those payments. Mm -hmm. Well, he really doesn't have much choice, and uh, most of them tell you there's no sense in reading it. They yeah. do what they want to with this contract anyway. W.O., uh, to wind up today, since we perhaps have some urban dwellers looking at our show, perhaps we should mention what the integrator gets for this broiler for which he pays the broiler producer, say, seven cents, and then eventually what the housewife pays for that same bird in the supermarket. Well, this is a rather integrated, uh, integrated process itself, Bill. 
Now, this integrator, start off with, bear this in mind. He has control of those baby chickens. He sets his price, or his markup, profit on the baby chicken. He sets it on the feed. Then he also processes that chicken. Mm -hmm. And he sets his processing cost in there. The only factor that he really can't set is the cost of growing those chickens. So they're kept so low until that's really not a factor anyway. No. And on this, this processor puts out this broiler this last year. They have averaged approximately 26 cents a pound, uh, ready to cook price, since the integrator does all this, mm -hmm. talk of this price in this range. And uh, he puts this out to the grocery, the corner grocery or the supermarket. And the average price there is usually 39 cents a pound. All right, so we're talking now about a chicken at the, uh, at the supermarket for, say, around a dollar and a quarter. Dollar thirty-five, for which the broiler producer received th uh, seven cents. Right. This chicken that the housewife has uh, purchased for the family meal, and incidentally, it has been uh, more or less a delicacy over the period until the last few years, and now it's a cheap meal of good wholesome food. I really enjoy W.O. Thomas. He's quite a guy, and I'm sure a very enthusiastic NFO worker down in Alabama. Yes, I agree, Bill. He's a tremendous leader. Bill, I want to thank you very much for being on our show today to sort of give us a new look at the broiler situation. It's been a pleasure having you. Appreciate it being here, Bill. And don't forget, soon the Educational Services Department will be featured on our show. we are looking forward to it. Thank you so much. My special guest today has been Mr. W.O. Thomas from Cullman, Alabama, and Mr. W.J. Talbert, Bill Talbert, who heads up NFO's Educational Services Department, and who has also worked predominantly and arduously in the broiler situation in the state of Alabama, and in fact, all over the nation. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week at this same time on this same station. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.